What's up, Interverse people? Got another intro before the intro, a pre-intro, if you will. And I'm really interested in this topic that we're going to be bringing up today. I'm talking to Derek Tukuri, the better known YouTube uh, researcher, Gematronator. He's got quite a lot of work on this subject. And to put it in a nutshell before we begin things, Gematria is the study of the numerical value of words and phrases and how that connects to different dates. It connects to astrology. And we see patterns in these numbers that can help us understand something about the deeper symbolic meaning in the reality around us, both from a media perspective and a personal individual level. So these synchronicities are deep. They can be sometimes really obvious and jump right out at you as soon as you start to do the research, or they can be difficult to riddle out and find, but I think there's something to it. I have done my own explorations with it. I found interesting connections in my personal life with, with the numbers, but it doesn't necessarily come easy. You'll get a few that jump out at you right away and you think, oh, wow, there's definitely a pattern here. But then you start putting together your name, the numbers for your name and the numbers for other people important to you. And you might not notice the connections right away. But if you start layering in looking at dates and the distance between dates, you might find more connections than you're initially discovering. And it might be one of those things that's not really there for everybody as far as obvious numerical connections. But there's so many numerical potentials. Whenever we're looking at dates, we're looking at names and phrases and things we might be interested in or really everything could be encoded into numbers. That means that... <laughs> It would take quite a lot of work to look at every part of the puzzle. So I uh, keep hope you keep an open mind on this conversation with Derek. It is definitely a wild subject. And if you get into some of his research and other people who do this on a full time basis, you will see that there's something there. But it's while simple, not necessarily the easiest thing to start cracking yourself. But maybe it is. Maybe you've got a mind for it. So anyway, uh, in the plus extension, which you can get on patreon.com forward slash interverse, we're going to talk about the dividing line between artificially conceived gematria significance that we might see in conspiracy or in mainstream media events and celebrity names and things like that. We're going to look at that in comparison to the organic matrix of numbers that embed themselves in our lives and nobody's in control of. No one's creating artificially. And try to figure out where the dividing line is between those two things. We also talk a lot about Derek's 666 Riddle and Kobe Bryant in the Plus Extension and a whole lot more. Uh, but I just wanted to give you guys a heads up that it's a really, really wild Plus Extension. You might want to get on the Plus membership if you haven't and you've been listening to the show for a while for this one because it's a deep one. <laughs> but all right, I think it's more than high time I actually start the real show. So thanks for joining us and get ready, buckle in, and I'll see you on the other side. There's a universe inside each of us. The Interverse Podcast is your portal to that infinite realm of ideas. I'm Chance Garten and I'll be your host as we serve up inspirational sound waves from the brightest minds with the highest vibes and we keep searching for the empowering perspectives we need to create our greatest masterpiece of all, our lives. All right, welcome to the One Within All, back to another episode of Interverse. This one is coming at you from, let me check the date here. It is June 13th in 2020, and... You know, the date is actually a pretty significant thing, and we're going to be talking about that with today's guest, as along with all kinds of elements of how numbers encode our reality. And if you're familiar with the trivium and quadrivium methods of learning and understanding the place that we live, you'll know that number really is a foundational concept that is built into every other way that we have of measuring or interpreting the reality. So I've brought it up on previous shows here and there, uh, especially lately, but I've been super into studying this numerical code, which you could call gematria for 
a couple of months now and very antsy to get somebody on to talk about it with us who's a bona fide researcher and expert. And today that's exactly what we've got. Derek, uh, uh, to, let me see here. What's your last name, brother? Uh, Takuri is a good sorry. way to pronounce it. Yep. I didn't have it written down in front of me. So Derek Takuri is also better known as the Gematronator on YouTube. And his website is of the same name, Gematronator.com, where he has been doing research for a good couple of years about just the way that our lives are encoded with numerical significance and how media events seem to be artificially drafted to line up numerically in very specific and special ways. So uh, it's a huge, deep rabbit hole to start getting into. But I think as far as any of the realms of truth research or conspiracy research that we may discuss, this is the one that's got the most convincing too crazy to be a coincidence type of stuff that you can point to and concretely say, I mean, there it is. Look at that. So we're going to get into the theory of gematria with Derek today. And in the, in the second hour, maybe get into more specific events and occurrences, but I really just want to introduce this topic to you guys so you can start looking into it for yourself and researching it and putting in your own important dates and your own names into the calculators that will show you the, uh, the numerical equivalent that those words might have and you can find that calculator at gematronator.com which will be linked in the show notes it is the first and best most complete gematria calculator in the entire internet so you can basically type in whatever you want see it through lots and lots of different ciphers and start making the connections for yourself i will really appreciative that derek is coming on today so i hope you guys go follow him on youtube support his work Check out his website and start getting your minds blown. And Derek, thanks for being here, man. Welcome to Interverse. Thanks a lot, Chance. It's an honor to be on here and uh, always love the opportunity to share this with more people. Yeah, it's definitely one of the easiest ways to sort of convert somebody from a normie into a truther, I would think, if they actually will look at it with you. Sure. I, I, I'd say what's probably more accurate is that it's, it's the best way to turn a, a skeptic into a truther. Um, because people, you know, they tend to believe what they want to believe. They will find things to support their current beliefs before they're willing to change their belief theory. I think it really takes someone to look at the news and like myself several years ago to just think, wait a minute, something is really off. And then when you show them Gematria, once they have that seed planted, that to me is uh, one of the best ways to wake some people up. And you don't have to be that mathematically inclined is the beauty of this is that it's so simple. And part of the reason I was skeptical about Gematria when I first came across it is because it was so simple. I said, this is almost too easy. Um, but when you start running the numbers and looking at the dates yourselves, you know, that's why I built the calculators because I wasn't happy with the methods available. Um, you start to realize that something very strange is definitely going on. So tell them a little bit about yourself, man. Like you got into, interested in Gematria before you started researching it quite a lot. Right. And you, if I'm not mistaken, you found gematria in your own life and personal events that made it seem significant to you before you started actually looking into the the gematria of the, the fake news headlines that we see every day sure yeah so my awakening kind of came in two waves i guess uh the first of which was back in 2004 when a friend of mine at work i was like 18 going on 19 at the time showed me a video from alex jones on 9 11 and i was never into conspiracies before that but 9-11 always seemed off to me. I didn't like, just, just didn't seem right. It seemed like there was more to it. So that was huge for me. I started to see the news and the world as a stage. I started to wonder about other people around me and how awake they were. Um, but throughout my twenties, you know, it didn't really help me in life. You know, I was, I didn't go to college. I didn't really have much going for me. So I had to focus on work and building a career for myself. I ended up in a relationship for seven, eight years and just kind of, brushed it off and mostly ignored it, tried to call as much of it as I could a coincidence. Um, but then around 2015, specifically the Charleston church shooting, I remember watching news coverage on it and the videos they were showing of the shooter, Dylan Roof, and the way they were covering the story, I said, man, it, it feels like they're trying to make me feel something from this story. Why can't they just report the facts? It feels like they're really diving in deep into parts of this that the news should, has really no business in. So I went on YouTube and saw that people still thought Sandy Hook was a hoax. And I'm like, wow, this, this hoax theory stuff is out of control. I'm going to find 
enough evidence to show that Sandy Hook happened and show these people they're crazy because I, I was intolerant of that at that time. So I started digging into Sandy Hook and after a couple of days, I was like, oh shit, this did not happen. This is not a real event. The school wasn't even in operation. I mean, there's no evidence of this. They tried to, you know, there's, there's been court cases where they were unable to provide documents for this. And I thought, okay, here we go. You know, so in my search for truth, I found a bunch of different YouTube channels because obviously the TV wasn't showing me anything I wanted to see. And a lot of these channels were talking about how the primary goal here is to take our guns. And I still believe that's a big part of this agenda in the long run. But, you know, a lot of these channels had high production values. Um, and I felt the same thing about YouTube as I was feeling about the television. Like these people are trying to make me scared or feel something or feel hatred or whatever. And then I came across Zach Cupboard's channel and he was just sharing his screen, sharing basic numerology, nothing fancy, nothing that, you know, was um, overproduced about it. And at first I thought it was a little wacky, you know, I mean, here he's taking the alphabet turning it into numbers, measuring from people's birthdays to the date of a news story. I'm like, whoa, this is kind of out there, you know, but at the same time, like the concept made sense. The idea that the language was a numerical code, um, because this goes back to Hebrew and Greek, you know, some of the original languages that humans spoke were also, uh, they doubled as numbering systems. So in Hebrew in Greek, if you wanted to write the number, you know, 311 or whatever, um, you would use letters. So you would use the letter that's worth 300. Then you would use the letter that's worth 10. Then the letter that's worth one to get 311. And in English, we have separate numbers and letters. We have the alphabet one through 26. And then we have separate numbers. But that's kind of relatively new in human history. So the idea that it was a numeric code made sense, but I had a hard time believing it was used in the fashion that he was saying in the media. So Ultimately, throughout like 2016, um, I was using these calculators online myself and I wasn't really happy with what I was seeing because I knew there were multiple ciphers and I wanted the study to be more efficient. So I had a lot of programming knowledge about Excel at the time because of my job. That's how I got to work for the company I do now. So I was using Excel and I started paying attention to this myself. And I felt like I was finding a whole bunch of things that Zach wasn't sharing that I thought were way more interesting. And it's not that Zach you know, knew about them and chose not to share. It's just all of a sudden we had this new way to look at things. And um, eventually this turned into me making the website, gematronator.com. I realized a lot of people don't have Excel or aren't very proficient in using it. So the website's been great for that. But essentially throughout 2016, you know, I was waking up to, it seemed like these sports events were rigged and, um, you know, all these phenomenal things were happening. The, the Cavaliers came back down from three games to one. The Cubs came back from three games to one in the same year, 2016. I thought there must be something to this, especially since Zach was predicting like the teams that would be in the Super Bowl months ahead of time. So, you know, at the time I was like, this numeric code that I'm looking at, this is all 100% conspiracy. This is man-made conspiracy. That's the only way my mind could process it. So, you know, ultimately this led to uh, the date that the Cubs won the World Series. and. Prior to the World Series, I made the prediction actually during the series. Um, I was at work at a lunch function and a couple of people asked me what I thought was going to happen because they knew I was a baseball fan. So I told them, I think the Cubs are going to win. And they're like, really? You a Brewers fan? You're going to say the Cubs are going to win? And I said, everything lines up, you know, and I even told them like the Cubs are going to lose one more game. So they go down three to one. Then they're going to win in seven games and they're going to win in extra innings. And the winning run is going to be scored by Kyle Schwarber. I said all these things. And then basically all of that came exactly true. The only exception is that the winning run wasn't Kyle Schwarber. It was the pinch runner who replaced Kyle Schwarber on base. So they were like, I came back to work the next day and they were like, people were looking at me like, what in the world? How did you know it to that level? And I was, I was freaked out myself because I watched the game and I'm expecting a completely rigged game. And, you know, maybe it was, but some of the things that happened in that game felt supernatural to me, you know, a home run hitting the camera um, in left field, a wild pitch that skipped out just barely in time for the runs to score. Like it didn't seem staged like I was thinking. So I, I at work that day, I, I went back to my desk and I said an honest prayer, like the first honest to God prayer I said in a good, good 10 years. And I was like, all right, people are now listening to me about numerology. Finally, 
Uh, but what the hell am I really looking at? You know, show me a sign. What's going on? And that started this whole um, event, this whole process of me waking up. So that same day that I said that prayer, my sister-in-law, who, whose house I was actually living in at the time, just before I bought my current house, she lost her father-in-law in a workplace accident. He worked at the same building that my dad works at. And, um, and I was like, that's pretty wild that that happened. And then I ran his numerology, the guy who died. And in the alphabetic order, his name summed to 108, just as it appears on the urn. And that was the same day the Cubs broke their 108-year curse. And there's so many more synchronicities with numerology. I said, whoa, like this is way deeper. This is way different than I thought. Just like that, overnight, basically. And that's when I first reached out to Zach. And you know, he had a lot of people reaching out to him at the time, so he didn't really respond. But um, finally, I called into the radio show, told him about the calculator. And he was like, yes, this is what we need. And the first Gematria video I made, he shared on his channel um, to like 50, 60,000 subscribers, which um, kind of made me um, a figure in the community overnight. So, you know, I owe him for that. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's essentially what started it. And I don't know if I would have had the motivation to go and do the calculator and teach Gematria had that event not happened because... I mean, yes, I, I, I always felt like I wanted to contribute to waking people up and um, better understanding this whole conspiracy idea, but, you know, I never knew how to go about it. And then with Gematria, it's just something was speaking to me all along, like, you got to help out with this. This is too important. You can't just ignore this. And, you know, as long as this propaganda machine is rolling and people are living in fear because of what they see on television, you know, to me, to my my being, my soul, like I have to counteract that. I have to keep exposing what's happening to people so that, you know, they can go back to living free lives and, and not be scared of the unknown, which has been the whole agenda for decades. And, you know, especially this year in 2020, it's been frustrating because in 2018, I used my understanding of biblical numerology to predict that 2020 would be the next year of the big 9-11 catastrophe. So the next big 9-11 scale event would be in 2020. And I even said, that it would be in Seattle. And a suburb of Seattle is where the first case of COVID-19 was diagnosed. So, you know, when we, when we talk about predictions, um, there have been a lot of predictions made. I'm trying to get to the point where we can make like exact predictions. You know, there's going to be a shooting in this city on this date um, and, and whatnot. And we're, we're starting to get there. In fact, over the past couple of weeks, I've been talking about June 20th and how this points to a potential Trump assassination. And that was before Trump began scheduling his campaign rallies. So he said he was going to be in Tulsa on June 19th. This news just came out a few days ago. And then after facing all this controversy, he changed the date to June 20th. And I'm like, man, you know, he can't just be in the White House and get assassinated. You know, there's, he's got to be out in public. So, you know, well, I don't want to get too into that because nothing's really happened. And um, I've always been sketch about making specific predictions because if I'm wrong, then it gives people a really easy chance to say this is bogus. But there's no way that nothing ritualistic is happening on June 20th. Um, I've never seen alignments like this in my years of research. So something to think about. But essentially, uh, in a nutshell, I guess that's my story is that, you know, I made these discoveries, I got into conspiracy and then saw this in my own life. And then I started realizing, if you write out my name, Derek DeCorey, you get the same gematria as the word gematria. My first name equals numbers. My last name equals letters. And I'm like, what are the odds of this? You know, my full name equals 1198. Reverse Gematria equals 1198. And it wasn't until I used my calculator that we started studying reverse Gematria. So there's something deeply mystical about this. Um, and it's every bit as much about synchronicity and mysticism as it is about conspiracy theory. I think it's both, of course, and it's important to understand the conspiracy side of it. But when you talk about the conspiracy side of it, it's a very dark energy you're bringing into people's lives. Um, you're, you're trying to explain to people that they've been lied to their entire lives. And that's not a very welcome thing to a lot of people. So if you can also introduce this side that, hey, you know, not only is there a conspiracy side to this, but reality itself is coded in a way. And we as people, you know, humans, the way I see it, we're like a neural network. You know, when you look at a colony of ants, you might see individual ants, but you don't hear those ants talking to each other. They're using some sort of electric impulses. Same thing with the cells in our body. You can see individual body cells, but in no way would you ever assume that those cells are working on their own volition, doing their own thing. They're all part of a network. 
human beings to me are the same thing to the earth. We are part of the whole same mothership that is earth and we're all connected. And I think human beings more or less may even be like a self-correcting system, which is why, you know, the most essential jobs, there's always people to fill them. Um, that to me in, you know, that to me is evidence further of this network. And then you look at the numerology underneath it and you're like, Oh <laughs> yes, that is real. So everything people say about the secret and manifesting your own um, desires um, all that is true. That's, that's all I'm saying. And all I'm saying is that there's a code to that output. So, you know, this has origins in the Kabbalah a little bit and we can get into that, but that's how I started and that's what keeps me going. So now I, I share both. Um, if, if there's a significant news event, I'll share, share the numerology of that event and why I think it's a hoax or why I think it's fake. Um, sometimes it's real. You know, that's the thing. It's like sometimes people really do die by the numbers. In fact, they always do. Um, I think there's a little bit of a rift in the Gematria community as far as how often people are getting murdered and how often people just die by the code. I think it's both. Um, so yeah, <laughs> here we are today, 2020. <laughs> Man. Yeah. There's so much there. Uh, I really am fascinated by that very question that you left off with. And there's a lot to respond to in everything you're just talking about, but, uh, I really like to try to explain to people why conspiracy research when it's authentic and when it's basically about finding the truth, that that is a form of spiritual work on yourself. And the problem obviously with conspiracy theory or conspiracy research is how many different brushes it's been painted with or ways that this stuff has been presented. Sometimes it's presented by actual controlled opposition agents. And I, I've gotten a lot better at being able to tell kind of what's what, and it usually has to do with how much they're trying to scare you, yep. <laughs> how much Very fear much. is true. involved. So yeah, like, like you said, you're bringing up dark stuff into people's awareness whenever you try to explain to them they've been lied to, but in a way you're just showing, shining a light on a spot that was dark for them and they didn't know was dark as opposed to trying to, you know, scare the crap out of people, fear porn people, you know, that's, that's a very common mistake that some people interested in conspiracy might make or might actually be done on purpose by certain agents of the system that want to keep the, the lid on the truth. So I, I'm curious what your thoughts are on, you know, conspiracy as being a spiritual type of component to someone's development, because I, I think you and I have both experienced that ourselves. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. So um, when you reached out for an interview, I, I peeked back on your channel and the, the one video I watched was the one where you had mentioned, uh, you know, music festivals. And, you know, in that video, it was either you or someone else mentioned how our individual personal spiritual awakening can somehow manifest freedom and peace for ourselves in reality. So you hear a lot about of, uh, a lot of conspiracy researchers talking about escaping the matrix. And, you know, when I first came across that, it's like, oh, does this mean like we're not going to live here anymore that I'm going to ascend into another world or whatever. But I think what they're talking about is this matrix of control, which is a spiritual system. Um, because, you know, the, the conspiracy is not guided by human beings. They are participating in it. Um, they're aware of it. And to an extent, they're coding it. But this is all inspired by dark energies. Satan, as Christians would call it, the demiurge as other religions and philosophies might call it. That's what I've grown into believing after several years of research. You know, these, it's like no matter how you squash evil, no matter how often you do it, it'll always creep back into humanity somehow. Um, but yeah, I feel like there's a lot of channels out there that, you know, as soon as this pandemic hit, the first thing they did is they started making videos talking about how this is going to lead directly to famine and they're going to zap us with 5G and kill us. And it's like, do you guys really think that they would have spent decades, centuries building this media empire just to take us out like that. Like this is more about controlling our minds because human beings are energetic beings. We're not just bodies. We're mind, soul, spirit. Um, that's, you know, there's three parts. So in order to harness that energy and they have to affect our minds, get us to accept and believe in certain things. Um, because if you follow natural law, which is another important part of, conspiracy research to me. Um, if you look, you know, I think Mark Passio did like an eight or nine hour uh, seminar on natural law that's on YouTube. 
And it's a lot to go through, but it is well worth it because it really provides great clarity as to understanding why this conspiracy is playing out in the fashion that it is. Um, because they understand karma is real. There's no getting around that. So the idea that I'm sharing this information, you know, the, and I was inspired to share my real name and everything by, by Zach, who did the same. And it's like, because what are they going to do? You know, if I put my name out there and then someone comes to my house and, and straight up takes me out, well, then I can be a martyr, I guess, you know, that then that gives legitimacy to it, but that's not going to happen because that's not how this works. If they did that, they're, they're bringing all sorts of negative energies onto their tasks and deeds. The key is to make people think that that's what's going to happen to them. Right. And that's why I'm not sure the whole Trump assassination thing is real. It's just like they could be trying to manifest it um, through coding and numerology, but then, you know, maybe it doesn't actually happen. I, I don't know, but you're right. So they can't attack me physically. What they could try to do is try to attack my reputation and that such. And they've done a lot of that to Zach. My work has never been quite as popular and common. And plus for me, like there's really not much to go on as far as negativity. Like there's nothing from my past to really dig up and assassinate my character with. So they have to rely on that. They, they have to make you look loony. They have to make you look crazy. And then, you know, long-term maybe remove your ability to make money. Um, fortunately, I haven't fallen victim to any of those tricks or whatever, but you know, cause the way I see it, um, when I was 16, I had a very strong spiritual experience with God. And at the time I was like, I don't know what life is. I don't know what I'm doing. Like, you know, help me out. What, what should I do? And I kind of accepted those energies. And now for me, the way I see it, as long as I'm helping people on their path and shedding this light on the part of their life that was previously dark, then hopefully God will help protect me doing in doing that. And that's my belief. And so far that's panned out. And that's really the evidence I've seen with everybody in this community who's doing this. Um, you know, it's been a lot of years that I've been paying attention to this stuff. And that to me seems very legit, very true. So I think there's a lot of, and YouTube is infested with fake truther channels. I mean, I don't want to get into flat earth theory, but I think that at least to a large extent that has a lot to do with it. And they're, they're just trying to distract people with as much as they can and, and still keep them in that 666 fear box um, because they know that that's the best way to manifest their actual desires. Um, and, you know, it's been a struggle of, with mine, uh, of me too, especially in 2020, watching coronavirus and people be afraid of it. You know, it's hard not to get upset with people and angry at people, but that's exactly what they want. They want those divisive energies down on the public so that people can drop their vibrations and then accept the more and more suffering. And that's essentially what they're asking us to do is suffer more and more slowly by slowly. That's why we're being asked to wear a mask for this virus, which has not proven at all to be more deadly than a common flu. You know, they're like, well, it's either the mask or the virus. Well, you know, for someone like me who's, who's grew up with asthma, you know, a mask in front of my mouth is really, really constricting and highly annoying, you know? So but my point is that, you know, we're being asked to accept little by little. And at what point do we say no? And already I'm saying no, you know, I'd, I'd rather risk this alleged virus, this invisible thing, which if you want my opinion, you know, science has been manipulated since the forties at, at the very earliest or very latest just to build these narratives that viruses can be contagious and deadly. Like, I don't think there's, you know, there's been pandemics in the past, but, um, you know, when you look at the 1918 one, for instance, there were a lot of other things going on with certain metals they were introducing into the population, the electric grid going up. So uh, my take is that there's much more to it than just simple transmittable viruses. And again, it's, be, it's that they want you to choose to take a vaccine. They can't just force you to take a vaccine. They want to convince the population to do it. And that's why they build this whole media empire, this whole false reality is so that they can get you to believe and, and accept these things because without that acceptance, they don't have permission to do it. And that again, goes back to natural law. So, you know, it, it makes all the sense in the world when you understand natural law and how they observe it and how they honor it in order to see how things are playing out, I think. Absolutely. I think people that aren't super familiar with the concept ought to check out that Mark Passio seminar. I'll see if I can remember to link it in the show notes when I'm going through and editing. That would be a really good primer for what we're talking about, but it's super basic. I mean, your understanding of karma should give you enough of an understanding of natural law, but there's some interesting nuances that 
I mean, he goes into a lot of detail, but the, it's as simple as like, don't defraud, don't steal, don't murder. I mean, pretty, pretty easy stuff that all of us should have as a part of our natural conscience. And, you know, another part of the conversation we might drift towards at some point is like, what is even the origin of psychopathy in humanity? Like, where did that come from? If most people are like me or like you and have an uh, innate realization of not harming other people to the extent that we are able to recognize that we are doing it and stop ourselves from doing it. But uh, about this, like dark force or anti-life force. I agree with you that it's not about exterminating all of humanity all at once and like some, flip some kill switch. <laughs> Although they want you to think they can do that with stuff like nukes, which again could just as easily be not even a, a real thing the way it's been described to us. Uh, right. It requires a lot of belief. <laughs> you, can't, you can't go find out how they work. <laughs> that tells you something right there. But I think the deal is, is that these this other side of the coin from goodness is like unable to imagine or create. And one of my ways of understanding God or the infinite or the all or the totality is that it's very much the same thing as what you experienced as imagination. It's just like a natural free, free flowing evolution of images and feelings and concepts that just like how your dreams are almost on automatic and they just generate novelty constantly. That's essentially that imagination force is like the foundation of all thought. And we know that thought and the mind is like the actual foundation of the physical universe. All, all is mental as it's said. And so these th things that are disconnected from source or from God, they can't imagine, they can't create, they just scavenge. And I think that's why the slave grid is really the move and not the uh, mass extermination is because they need in a parasitic way to feed off of beings that actually do have a connection to light or truth or, or uh, whatever you want to label it as all these things are kind of synonymous synonymous. Yep. Yeah. I, I definitely agree with that. Um, because, you know, when you listen to music that, the, is produced by the Illuminati, so to speak. And this is all over the place. I mean, it's most big hits on the radio, Jay-Z, Beyonce, Katy Perry, things like this. Um, these songs are engineered scientifically, not creatively, because they're manipulating your brain waves and your emotions. Um, it's, it's manipulative. It's not to build this bridge to light. And, you know, one thing I always say to people too, is like, you know, we go, I've gone to a, several music festivals where, you hear this music that's just so uplifting, so awesome, and it just makes everyone feel and glow and smile and, and just love everything. And I'm like, how can, how can these festivals sell out half a million people every year? These tickets sell out in minutes. How come this music isn't on the radio? You can't turn on a, an FM radio station and find like uplifting trance or EDM or anything like that. And to me, that is just like a perfect example of how these... Um, this conspiracy understands the idea of energy and, and music, how it relates to energy and positivity. Um, and then th this is all about the 432 versus 440 Hertz also is that they're kind of creating these discordant brainwaves with the music that we listen to, um, which I still listen to. I mean, I still enjoy it, you know, whatever, as long as you're aware of what's happening and, and not letting it affect you. I think that's great. Um, so, and then in another example that I look at is, comedians, right? So in order to be a big time comedian, who's really funny and makes it big, you have to be really creative. You have to work hard and practice and, and have a certain passion for it. And, and also not be afraid of failure. And in order to be that kind of person, I think you have to be connected to the source. You know, you have to be creative and, and be light. So the comedians that, you know, are pushed by the mainstream are not like the funniest comedians. And now they're, they're usually talking about like, social injustice issues, you know, trying to keep our minds thinking about all these divisive topics. Um, and, but like, and you see, you see it like these comedians get squashed and I, I do post a lot on pro wrestling too, because to be a pro wrestler, like you have to have a passion for that industry. It's not just that you were born into a family and, and uh, they chose you from birth. And then, you know, that's your role. It's like, you have to be a legit person. And then that's why they, you find these, they give these guys scripted promos and, so I guess what I'm getting at is that you're right. It's like this energy that is trying to um, 
essentially suck the, our positive energy from us has no creativity. They, they have to manipulate people who are creative and then kind of like put them in public positions and hope that they can compromise them and twist their message. That's the best they can do because they themselves are incapable of that. And that's why I think it's interesting when you hear people talk about like how, uh, you know, they spent time with Donald Trump and he was just so laser focused and like he never talked about music, never understood music, never under, under, uh, never enjoyed it. Not just Trump, but other people as well. I've heard this about. So yeah, there's, there's a definite innate difference in DNA. And I think when you talk about psychopathy, it's like this energy is, it's somehow interstellar. It's destined to be here. Um, and it's part of this, this neural network, I think, um, some sort of balance, you know, and when, when you talk about coronavirus and what's really killing people, I mean, yes, it does certainly seem that people are getting really sick and perhaps there's a new strain of flu. And I don't know if you've had a bad flu before I have, and I'm like, Hmm, am I going to (laughs) die? Like flus can be really bad, you know? So a lot of these people who are getting sick, it's like, you know, I was that sick with the flu 12, 13 years ago, but because the media is telling them it's a deadly virus, hey, if you believe it, all of a sudden the spirit of death may enter you. And I 100% believe that's a part of this is that this is spell casting. There's a reason they call it spelling when we look at words and letters. And that's because they are literally casting spells. And when you look at Hollywood, you know, the bark of a holly tree used by magicians, um, it's because they're casting spells with this language. And when people are, under that spell, that's when these other spirits can enter their lives. And perhaps that spirit is death. So again, it's, it's a manipulation of the spiritual realm in order to um, reduce the population more so than just zapping you or, you know, entering your house and injecting you. They got to get you to accept it, believe it and manifest it yourself. I think that's a really good point. I think that also could play into what we see with like, the scientism, the the main religion of the masses these days, where that I get this all the time. Like, so you you think thousands and thousands of scientists around the world are wrong about X, and to me, that's like an obvious logical apa- fallacy. Is it's the appeal to authority, right? So it's not an it's not an argument for something being accurate to say thousands of people b- believe it, regardless of how credentialed they might be. But this. You talked about the dual slit experiment in one of your videos and um, another one that I'd never even heard of, which was the, the let's see, the DNA, uh, phantom DNA effect. Yeah. That was super far out. And yeah, with, if we can measure these types of influences that our mind has on reality, in a, we can actually measure it even in a, a way that seems to transcend normal linear time. To me, that seems like evidence that if you have a person that's trained and indoctrinated with all of the theories of modern science, which are still theories for the most part, most things that people take as fact and believe as dogma, then it's very likely to me that when they're doing their work or observations or experiments, they are probably going to create the conditions that allow them to see what it is that they already believe should be there. And I think right. that could easily be a big factor in why it's so easy to uh, hoodwink people that even have probably the tools to to uh, ha- to dissent from the mainstream argument, but they only see what they're conditioned to believe. Sure. So along that line, like how many of these scientists who are supporting the research and these measures being taken, how many of them actually sat in a lab and, you know, studied the virus and transmitted it and proved to themselves that it existed, like virtually none of them. They're going off of research that's given to them. So just because a scientist says something, that doesn't necessarily hold more weight because you have to understand why they say something. And if they're just saying something because of certain research that may be cherry picked that they're given, well, then they're being manipulated too. And this, you know, it goes back to the moon landing theory, like all those people in the, in the NASA room looking at the computers they could have totally believed that they were landing on the moon, but the data they were being fed, they don't know where that source came from. Um, So it's similar to me in the science community. And, you know, you look at these World Health Organization, the CDC, all erected right around the end of World War II. Now, remember, the U.S. did not defeat the Nazis in World War II. The U.S. absorbed the Nazis in World War II. And all of those ideologies instantly came into our culture. And they constructed all of these um, medical establishments that have world authority now 
And they're the ones responsible for this whole narrative, this whole idea of how viruses are transmitted. And, you know, another thing I, I talk about with the 1918 flu pandemic, it's like, wasn't that a time where hygiene was like hardly even a thing? <laughs> you know, we're, we're way advanced now. Why are we even believing that a virus can do this in the first place? I mean, if, if you talk about a morphed coronavirus, you know, they're calling this COVID-19, it's still just a coronavirus. So it doesn't have any more capabilities to be more transmittable than another virus. Maybe it survives a little bit longer, but the idea that all of a sudden someone within six feet of us could die because of someone else who's asymptomatic. I mean, that's absurd. And you're starting to see this now where, you know, you're seeing the news story after news story where they're trying to roll back on their previous statements where Dr. Fauci now is coming out and saying, hey, maybe these lockdowns aren't a great idea. And hey, maybe a second wave isn't guaranteed. And you're also seeing the World Health Organization say things like, you know, maybe we were wrong about asymptomatic spreading. It's actually pretty rare, but those ideas were already in people's minds. They're, that's already been implanted. It's like, uh, you know, in, in Sandy Hook, for instance, when uh, they mentioned a couple days later, you know, all these random coincidences. But by that point, people had already been traumatized. And that goes back to the MK Ultra. I mean, this is a project that the government ran for over 20 years. And now MK Ultra is still in work. However, we get to see it every day in the mainstream media. I mean, that is a 100% trauma-based mind control operation. And by scaring everybody into fear about this deadly virus, the trauma already took place on a lot of people. So it doesn't matter what they say to scale back on that because the fear is the most important thing. And once that's implanted, people will behave accordingly to that. And you know, as long as they believe the media, those, those stories that trickle out about the, the virus maybe not being that dangerous aren't even going to register. And you know, they should have never really believed it was that dangerous in the first place, given the statistics. But uh, people don't have, you know, minds for numbers and statistics. This is something that's become clear to me trying to share gematria with everybody is that it's, you know, it's a percentage of us that do. Um, but when you look at, you know, the, the official cases to deaths, it's going to, it's been like 20, 25 to one, but then they go out and test random people who haven't been tested and they find like 5% of them have it too. So that means the death rate is like 0.0001. And if you talk about deaths without comorbidities, then it's almost zero. Um, in fact, the graph that they gave for mortality rate by age for COVID-19 at the start, it was the exact same as the morbidity rate for anybody without like in life. So they were saying if you're like 18 to 20, you have a point, you know, 1% chance of dying from the virus. If you're 18 to 30, you have a 0 0.025 or whatever. Well, you got a 0 0.025% chance of dying every year, no matter what. <laughs> so. What's, what are we afraid of? And, and the idea that people are accepting all these measures, I mean, that just goes to show me how far gone, unfortunately, a lot of them are. But it's never too late. Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing this work still. You know? Absolutely. And with all the stuff you pointed out, I'm aware of that too. You brought up YouTube censorship to me at one point. I don't know if that was on the air or not. But before, yeah, yeah. Yeah, before. But I know that one guy that's been censored pretty bad is Dr. Andrew Kaufman, who is a guy disputing... Germ, <laughs> germ theory completely. So there's more than one person that's actually coming and trying to take apart the what's going on and explain it in an alternative way, or at the very least dispute the the belief system and the dogma that everyone's entrenched with. So that's interesting stuff. If you want, if you guys want to check out uh, podcasts or other you know materials by Andrew Kaufman, I recommend checking that guy out if you're interested in that argument that maybe you know the germ theory isn't even uh correct but man there, there's so, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff we could talk about i'd love to get into a little bit of gematria examples and since we're already on the topic yeah I mean, we don't have to go too too deep in the connections to just see what you can come up with off the cuff because i know without like your notes in front of you it might be difficult because there's so many links and connections, but you've probably got a lot of it in there like a steel oh, trap. Oh yeah. I wanted to talk about the Kobe uh, Corona connection. Oh yeah. I'd love to. That, Cause I think that will really get people interested to see how the, um, the you, cause you brought up sports a little bit, but it's not just that sports are by the numbers and sports is rigged and all that. And that's separate from like what's going on on CNN and Fox news. It's actually all part of the same and it's all part of the same right. web, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. Most, a lot of these athletes, um, especially the good ones, you know, they're, they're compromised, so to speak. And maybe that wasn't their plan when they got into sports, but that's how it turned out once they saw all the money they were getting. So they'll go out and they'll send a tweet out just to kind of rile some feathers in the public. 
and they're always pushing the narrative. Uh, you see this all the time. So the, th- the whole thing with Kobe, I mean, the first thing that I talk about with new people with Kobe Bryant is I point out how he was buried in California in a city called Corona Del Mar. <laughs> and people are like, oh, that's interesting, you know. And of course, shortly after he dies, well, he dies while coronavirus is becoming a pandemic. And then, you know, shortly thereafter, it, it's declared a pandemic. So let's talk about Kobe. That's always a fun one. So when we're talking about gematria, um, this is geometry within the language. Some people pronounce it gematria or gematria. I like the hard G because it's geometry in language. So essentially what this is, is the idea that letters are numbers. And the most basic cipher that I teach is called English ordinal, which assigns a number to each letter in the alphabet relative to its position, one through 26. So it's essentially the most basic cipher there is. And uh, would it work if I did a screen share? It says uh, you disabled that. No. Oh, okay. Let me make sure it's enabled. Um, Sure. Try it now. All right. Okay. We haven't done this very many times, but it's definitely something I can do. And it'll be part of the video. If if you guys listening now are on just the audio RSS feed and want to hop over to the YouTube video or the Facebook video or wherever you might find it and just find this part of the show by the timestamp, then you'll be able to see pulled up on the screen share that we're looking at the gematronator.com calculator and he's going to start. (laughs) And I think this is kind of crucial for this part of the conversation because it's one of those things where if you can see it, not just hear it, it kind of sinks in a little bit more, just how beyond coincidence some of this stuff is. And you can see how it all adds up. Yeah, I feel like gematria is definitely a visual topic. Um, You can listen to it and understand it, but it requires much, much more focus. So it's always better to share visually. So on the screen now, what I'm showing you is the uh, the alphabetic order. And these are the base four ciphers. We'll talk about the rest of these in a second. But again, the most simple, the most basic English ordinal. And in this method, you see the name Kobe equals 33. And this is a number that's commonly stamped into basketball legends. So we recently had Michael Jordan, Michael equals 33. Um, his documentary aired during the pandemic. Magic equals 33. Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, Bird equals 33. He even wore number 33. And then we had uh, Dr. Julius Irving. Irving equals 33. They called him Dr. J, Dr. equals 33. Now, the significance of 33, I mean, obviously this is a big number. The highest degree of masonry is 33. And masonry equals 33 in gematria. At least we're told that's the highest degree, but... What's important to understand is that this code of letters and numbers comes from the Bible, essentially. So when we talk about the origins of Gematria, we talk about Hebrew, you know, one of the first written languages, if not the first. And Hebrew actually evolved from hand hand gestures. So people used hand gestures to communicate. This turned into the Hebrew alphabet. And then kind of after the fact, they discovered that there's significant mathematical alignments in the language. So the first five books of the Bible called the Hebrew Torah, all written in Hebrew. And then this evolved into the New Testament um, and the King James Bible, you know, from the 1500s, 1600s. And uh, the, the New Testament starts with the crucifixion of Jesus. And really, when you look at deaths of celebrities, deaths of rappers, musicians, athletes, whatever, it's almost strictly by this eclipse crucifixion code. And in the New Testament, during the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, uh, darkness falls under over the sky and it can't be an eclipse because it's Passover, which is a, f- a full moon, not a new moon. So maybe there was a lunar eclipse and there actually was a lunar eclipse on April 3rd, 33. Um, but in three of the four gospels, it talks about this darkness over the sky. And it's interesting because they say that Jesus died at the age of 33. The word eclipse equals 33. And in the alphabetic order, English ordinal, crucifixion of Jesus Christ equals 303. And what's, what I want to point out about this number is that it has a zero in it. And when you're looking at the results in numerology, these zeros are not significant. This is ignored. And that's why the Jewish gematria value is also significant, 24. Think about Kobe Bryant wearing number 24. And this is because it's all part of this crucifixion code that they use on our celebrities. So the name Kobe 
sums to 33 in the alphabetic order. And of course, again, Jesus, 33, we're taught that he was crucified at, in 33 AD. Well, 33 has prime factors of 11 times three. Um, prime numbers only divisible by one in itself. 33, not a prime. So you have factorization. And the reason that's interesting is because when you write out Kobe Bryant, it equals 113, like 11 times three. The National Basketball Association in reduction equals 113. And speaking of this reduction cipher, this is very uh, related to English ordinal. Essentially, what we're doing here is using the rules of numerology to reduce a double digit number to a single digit. So here we see J, the 10th letter. Well, this is a double digit number. So in order to get the reduced value, we have to add the digits together. One plus zero is one, which gives us our reduction value. And this works for every letter up through Z. Z is the 26th letter. You add two plus six, you get eight. So Z becomes eight in reduction. So this is also called Pythagorean or, uh, well, you know, reduction gematria. And this is the one that really seems to bring everything together. I mean, you read any numerology book, they say that this is how you calculate the, the numbers of your name. So, um, and then we also have the reverse alphabetic order, which is Z through A, 1 through 26, just a simple flip of the alphabetic order. Um, and that method can be reduced also. So these are like complementary ciphers to the ordinal and reduction. And um, this provides a little bit of symmetry. I guess I won't get too deep into that now, maybe for the second hour, but um, so Kobe I want to just say about the, the ciphers real quick. If yeah. you were like a spy agency or someone trying to encode information that you didn't want everyone to find out, but you wanted it to be visible to others that understood your code, you would use multiple ciphers. You wouldn't just use one cipher. And you know what I mean? So right. I think that's really Thank relevant <laughs> to have that as a, like a, a foundational understanding so that you're not just like, well, if you use enough ciphers, it's, it's going to work eventually. But, you know, there's there's a reason why there's more than one cipher available. Right. A lot of people, as soon as they see the reverse order, they're like, oh, now you're playing with numbers. Well, what you said is exactly correct. And I, I try to stress that to everybody. Like if they, if they were coding things where it was just one method and you, you could just see the same number with everything, well, that would be too obvious. I mean, that, that would be too easy to wake up to, but because you have these calculation methods and they're all logical, you know, flipping the alphabet around, think about it as above, so below. If we can play records backward and get hidden messages, why can't we turn the alphabet backwards and get hidden messages? Um, so it just seems logical. As far as Jewish gematria, this other cipher, this is also called a Latin gematria. And it's based in the Latin alphabet, which was the world's most prominent language for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And you'll see the, the letters that were created for the English alphabet are at the end of this cipher. And when we talk about large number ciphers like this, we're essentially looking at a mirror of the ancient Hebrew gematria and Greek isopsophy charts. Um, notice how they number these letters differently, 1 through 9, then 10 through 90, and then 100 through 900. So there's another method called English Extended, which uses a similar structure but it uses our current 26 letter alphabet. So the ciphers that you see on the screen now are the base six. These are essentially the same six ciphers I use in every decode. And yeah, you can sometimes find maybe coincidences, but it shouldn't be this easy. <laughs> and for years now, I've been blogging like just every single major news story, boom, by this code. And really what brings it together is aligning it with dates on the calendar. And there's something called arithmancy which is literally divination through numbers. And I contend that that's all this is. Gematria is divination, of course, exploring the conspiracy behind it as well. Um, but when we're talking about arithmancy, to me, it's not just gematria. It's also understanding how dates work. So when we look at the name Kobe Bryant in our base ciphers, I want you to notice these 41 in reduction and 157 in the reverse order. When you pull up Kobe Bryant's date of birth, you find it's August 23rd of eight, uh, 1978. And he died 
January 26th, 2020. Well, look at how old he was when he died. 41 years, 157 days, just like his name, Gematria, 41 and 157. Now, think about how, like I mentioned, he was buried in Corona del Mar, which is something you can find in his Wikipedia. Buried in Corona del Mar. Well, coronavirus was declared a pandemic by the, uh, the World Health Organization on March 11th, or the 11th of March, written 11 slash 3. Kobe Bryant equals 113, just like that. And coronavirus pandemic in reverse sums to 113 in reduction. Also notice the 220, and it was declared a pandemic on 11 slash 3 in the year 2020. And this all has to do with Donald John Trump, our president. His name equals 220. Um, it's definitely the year of the, uh, a big shift. And to me, this has to do with numerology. So in numerology, and I don't talk too much about the actual meanings of numbers in my videos because that's a science that's well explored. It's not something I'm any better at than anyone else. So I don't talk about it too much, but when, when we're talking about numerology, master numbers are always really important. So you're talking about 11, 22, 33. Well, notice how the, the word master equals 22. Well, 22 is called the master builder number. And master builder number equals 220 in Gematria. And think about how the last time we had significant societal change was the year 2002 after 9-11. Another 22 year. Um, so this, these are all connected. So right off the bat, we see significant things with Kobe Bryant. But um, the whole thing with coronavirus is a, is a 666 riddle. And uh, if you don't mind me um, imbibing a little bit here with 666, you know, 666 is a very, like everybody knows 666 is this evil number of the beast or whatever, straight out of the book of Revelation. But I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about what it truly represents. And if you look at the geometry of the earth, the sun, the moon, that to me is what this entire code is based off of. So um, the sun is at, let me see if I can find this here. Um, so one of these posts I did explains how the, the Earth's axis, the polar axis, is tilted 66.6 .6 degrees from the plane to the sun. And not only that, but that means this leaves an angle that's 23.4 degrees. If you measure you know, the, the other way, from the, uh, the polar axis to the orbit axis, so to speak. And 234 plus 432 is 666. And if you look at the uh, radius of the sun, you find it's 432,000 miles. Um, so the number 666 is significant to the geometry of how this all works. Now, if you write out sun, moon, and gematria, you get a value of 666 in Sumerian. Um, and this number is coded into the moon as well. And let me explain. When we write out this phrase, mathematics of the circle, and I want you to think about the shape the moon is in the sky. You know, the ancients would have just seen it as a, just a circle that just goes around in the sky. Well, mathematics of the circle sums to 666 in Latin gematria. And when you multiply six times six times six, you get a product of 216. And in English ordinal, the same phrase equals 216. And then you look up the moon and you find out the diameter of the moon is 2,160 miles exactly at the equator. If you take the Roman numerals for 2160, which I have to think about sometimes, 2160, and then type in the moon, it sums to 666. And then you write out 666 it equals 156, which in Hebrew is the same value as their word for eclipse. And an eclipse can only occur one, five, or six lunar phases after the last eclipse. Remember how I said it's a 66.6 .6 degree 
to the plane of the sun. Check out plane of the sun. 156. Eclipse equals 33 in reduction. Very significant number. Well, 33 equals 156. And then you look at the 156th prime number and it's 911. And all of a sudden it's like, whoa, 911. That's the date of the biggest false flag terror attack in US history. And in 2001, it was the first time. Now, Grant, this only happens like once every four to 500 years is that there's a total solar eclipse on the summer solstice. That happened in the year 2001. So all of this has to do with eclipses. I mean, it, significantly so. Um, I, think, I think you're totally right on with that. The eclipses are, well, I mean, we're between two big eclipses. You could say that if this uh, book of Revelations scripture script is the playbook that things are going off of, that the two eclipses were between could be like the beginning and end points of something to do with that. Yep. And I'm, I totally feel that actually the last, uh, the big one that was in 2000, it was in 2018, right? The total, a total eclipse that covered the Midwest of the United States, August 21st, 2017, 2017. I always mix that up. Yeah. So I was, I was actually in a area where there was totality for that. And it was a, a small music festival type gig. And one of the things that blew my mind the most about that was that, first of all, everyone had these eclipse glasses on. So beyond just being able to see the light, like the dimmed light from the eclipse, they couldn't see anything else. I tried them on and took them back off. I was like, I don't think I need these. And uh, anyway, me and one other person didn't wear them. And we were the only people that observed that during the eclipse, right as the corona of the sun, if you will, started to shine through the uh, where it's being covered, like when the disc starts to just uncover and there's that first ray of light from the eclipse ending. And yeah. uh, right at that point, a plane flew right across the path of the sun at that exact spot where the light started to peek through. So it was like, wow, from our observation point, this plane intersected the uncovering of the solar disk in perfect timing while trailing huge pink clouds behind the plane that spread out and covered the whole sky after the event. And nobody at the whole place that I talked to, except one other person who wasn't wearing the glasses, even noticed that there was a plane flying in front of the sun while they were staring at it. And it was the weirdest thing I've ever experienced as far as like mass, um, mass illusion i guess like all these people that literally didn't see what happened right in front of their eyes and i just wondered what your thoughts might be on that <laughs> well that's really interesting so you said you were at a festival were you in oregon by chance no a lot of my friends went to the oregon one but there was actually totality could be seen in missouri which is where i'm at and okay. uh so this was gosh i can't remember the name of the town i can look it up some other time but it was called darkening of the sun festival and okay. Yeah, it was actually in the total eclipse path. So, so, yeah, that's really interesting to me. I was in uh, southern Illinois for it. And I, I mean, there were people who were wearing their glasses during totality. But that to me is so dumb. Like, there, there's no reason to wear your glasses once the, once the moon completely covers the sun. It's, that's what's so beautiful about it. If you're wearing their glasses during the totality, you're missing out on the, on the best part. Um, so when I, I didn't have the glasses on during totality, obviously. So when the sun started to show itself again, you talk about those like, you, you don't just all of a sudden see the part of the sun. You see these like, like these light bursts, sort of this, this diamond coming back. Um, and that to me was one of the most powerful parts of the eclipse. Uh, I heard like conspiracy rumors or whatever about NASA sending up balloons in the path of totality that we're going to explode and like, just like send some sort of virus down to the people who are watching it. I don't buy any of that stuff, <laughs> but uh, you know, it's kind of ridiculous yeah. to me, but Agreed. Um, it's, it's interesting that something like that would happen over a festival, you know, like, I don't know, maybe they were just doing it artistically and, uh, and wanted to give an extra show in addition to the eclipse, especially since they flew over right as it ended. It almost seems calculated. Maybe it's a hell of a coincidence, but uh it felt calculated, but I mean, I just have no idea what the significance of it would be. I think someone actually from somewhere nearby, but that wasn't at the festival, actually got a photo of it, of the plane 
as I describe it. So I have to dig that up maybe. But I, I know I talked about it back in 2017 when it happened because it was such a mind blow. But so we're we're at the top of the first hour here, ready for a a short break, and it's a good spot for people to hear from you where they can find your stuff again. Of course, the show notes will be containing all the links to Derek's channels, but you know, remind them one more time in their ears. <laughs> sure, right on. I'll uh, just spell it out real quick. The name of the website, it's called Gematronator, and that's spelled G-E-M as in mother, A-T-R-I-N as in nature, A-T-O-R. Or you can just go to Google and type in Gematria. And on the first page, you'll probably see a link to the world's best Gematronator, or Gematria calculator, Gematronator.com. I'm also on Twitter. I believe it's uh, at Gematronator, um, Gematronator.com, and on YouTube, Gematronator underscore 85. So my first YouTube channel was Gematronator underscore 64. 64 is my birthday. Birthday even equals 604 in Gematria. Then my channel got deleted, so now I'm using my birth year of 85. Um, so yeah, it's, it should be pretty simple to find. Again, just the word Gematria in a search engine is pretty good for that too. So uh, Come check it out. Subscribe. Uh, you know, YouTube, although they're not deleting my videos anymore so much, uh, they have changed their algorithms. So you can't find my stuff until you go to like page 10 or 20. Uh, so it does kind of rely on people sharing the information in order for new people to find it. So everyone's encouraged to do so. Uh, I don't really profit off of the work. I don't ask for money very often outside of times where I'm uh, ref you know, funding my website. So the servers stay online. Um, but yeah, everything's free to share. Everyone's encouraged to do so. And if you think someone's a skeptic and you want to wake them up to this side of reality, then by all means, everyone's free to do so. Yeah, it's a good place to go to do that. And I really appreciate you coming on for us. And we'll see everybody that's a plus member in the second hour. Got plenty of more ammunition for conversation. And uh, it's been awesome. Thanks, Derek. All right. Thanks, Chance. Appreciate it. Well, guys, what'd you think about that one? <laughs> Something I've been kind of obsessing over for a couple of weeks now is this Gematria deal and I'm up and down with it. I find some days where the numbers are all lining up and making sense all the way down to getting synchronicities on my receipt at the grocery store Two days where I'm not so sure about this. Is there really anything to it? Or are we just making connections that aren't there? So if you're on the fence like that, you know, I'm right there with you. I kind of try to stay in the middle on everything and not overly believe any one thing. But sometimes the evidence is hard to dispute as far as being coincidental, especially when you look on the conspiratorial side of Gematria and you're considering just where all these numbers are linking up from. Like, is that really organic or is there some kind of spell being cast? And you got to realize even the English language was created by some Vatican monk a while ago, <laughs> quite a while ago. But it's a controlled language as far as the priestcraft that went into designing it. And I think a lot of people would agree that in a lot of respects, the English language is kind of a slave language. It's also the language of the, you know, seemingly the freest people on earth right now. But the mainstream religions, the language we're given, all of these things are like an operating system that in many ways is coded with slavery in it i mean slavery to a lot of different aspects i won't go into it all the way but you know one evidence that we are modern day slaves to governments is the whole public education thing back in the day your education if it was going to be a good education required what was called the quadrivium which i kind of mentioned in the intro but the quadrivium is the four classical arts of number geometry music and cosmology I got a, a quadrivium book right here that I recommend anyone picking up if you're curious about the subject. It's just called quadrivium. Uh, but what these four arts are actually doing are showing how number is encoded into everything in the universe. So first is arithmetic. And I thought it was so interesting that Derek brought up arithmancy, arithmancy in the plus extension, which I guess is divination based on arithmetic. But Obviously, math is a foundational thing you got to understand before you start moving into any other type of higher sciences. And the second part of the quadrivium being geometry is showing how number and space correlate because you're looking at 
volumes, distances, diameters, all that shape. That is number in space, in distance. And then, of course, music is number with time, number and time combined, because, well, you could consider that the numbers are the tones and the time is obviously, you know, the meter and the rhythm of the music. And then the fourth part, cosmology, is actually combining number with time and space at the same time because you're looking at distances but also circular patterns whenever we talk about say astronomy or astrology so in the long ago times the philosopher teachers probably wouldn't even want to take you on as a student if you didn't already have a solid grasp of the quadrivium it's really important and you do get a type of geometry class in modern public school you get the cosmology that they want you to get the NASA cosmology that's got a lot of problems with it that someday we're going to talk about in its own episode and um, music is optional. <laughs> so that should tell you a lot right there. The music is optional in school and it's not something that is uh, required. I mean, obviously I don't think anything should be required or forced on humanity, but if we were going to have a good public education system, you would think that they would attempt to balance the right and left brain aspects of what they're teaching kids but that's not what we get anyway i did some experimenting with gematria just at the uh just before i started this outro right here i was looking up my parents names which i hadn't checked out yet and what was weird was they had the same value as each other in reverse ordinal so that was kind of cool uh deeper connections were a little bit harder to find but i did find an interesting date connection between me and my sister where one of the numbers in her name was the same as the number of weeks it was from my birthday to when she was born and she's my younger sister. So stuff like this is kind of hard to pull out and it takes a, a real mind for the riddles, but you know, there's some value in that because at the very least you might be able to use these ideas as a way to show somebody that's kind of locked into materialism that there's something deeper going on. These coincidences are mathematically unlikely. <laughs> or maybe it's all coincidence. I can't prove it to you. But I do love thinking about this type of stuff, especially from the perspective of idealism, that all is mind, that we are in some way deeply intrinsically connected with the creative intelligence that organizes all things and brings, uh, brings something out of the chaos and gives us life, you know? I think we're deeply connected to that, to the source. <clears throat> Excuse me. But um, we talked about a lot of crazier stuff in Plus. I should let you know about that before I go much further. First of all, if you don't have Interverse Plus, it's really easy to get. Patreon.com forward slash Interverse. There'll be a link in the show notes. There's a link on the website right at the top. And it's only five bucks a month. You get the two hour version of all these episodes and... I'm not going to lie to you and say that you can't get Derek's research for free on his YouTube. Uh, some of the things that we talk about in this episode, but you won't get our dynamic, him and I together. You know, hopefully you're paying for me on the plus extension, not just the guest. But I do think that you could be enticed by some of the topics our awesome guest for this week we're talking was talking about. And, you know, it's not that much to ask for to get five dollars a month from you guys. If you are big fans of the show or been listening for a while it's a win-win. We both get something out of it. I think you'll have fun with the extensions because uh, stuff always gets deeper after we got warmed up. But anyway, in this plus extension with Derek, we finished up his uh, explanation of the 666 riddle connecting Kobe Bryant and coronavirus. There's a lot to that. Really liked being able to use the screen share in this one to hopefully you guys join along on YouTube or somewhere where there's the video version of this. And we're able to see it, too, because it does make it a lot more interesting. We also talked about the dividing line between artificial gematria or like contrived conspiracy events and the organic matrix of reality. And he seems to have discovered a lot of organic numerical synchronicity in his own life. I'm trying to do that same thing. and I'm finding a little bit of it. But I, <laughs> at first, I was kind of discouraged that I was only finding a few things on a cursory glance at say names of my family members and their birth dates. But realistically, Derek has probably spent like hours and hours and hours looking at this stuff. And I looked at it for like 15 minutes just before I started talking to you. So 
Uh, if you do the same thing as me and take a short glance at it and you don't find much, don't necessarily rule everything out here. I mean, be skeptical, of course. Don't believe things that you have no basis of believing. But I do think there's something here. And especially if you're following people like Derek or Zachary Hubbard, you'll see that they find connections to stuff all the time. And they even kind of make predictions that seem to have some validity to them. Anyway, in the plus extension, we also talked about the numerical evidence that the George Floyd video isn't what it seems and was in some respects manufactured as part of the divide and conquer strategy of people that wanted further enslaved humanity. Now, that being said, I'm not going to argue with anyone that says there's not police corruption or police brutality. That's very true. Or that there isn't systemic racism still alive in the United States. That is very true. So whenever I talk about uh, conspiracy stuff related to George Floyd or in the future, something about the Black Lives Matter movement or anything like that, just know I'm definitely not <laughs> anti-equality or anti-freedom. Um, all of that. But I'm anti-division. I don't want us to be divided. And I don't want us to get mixed up about what, where the real problems are stemming from in the country because most of your average people aren't the racist people. There is systemic racism, though. Uh, <laughs> I saw this crazy thing about Louisiana, which has got a lot of occult stuff going on with it anyway. I mean, isn't the capital Baton Rouge, which is like saying red baton? And don't police beat the shit out of people with batons? Well, what I found out about Louisiana today was that their uh, entire state government is like, completely filled with ex law enforcement people and they've got the highest incarceration rate per capita, like on earth, I think not just in the United States, but possibly anywhere. And the really, I mean, this isn't even slightly funny. So let me say that this is actually the worst thing that could be. I mean, it's just, it's just crazy that this could still be a, a, the case in 2020, but there's like prison labor used in Louisiana and Louisiana has a lot of African-American people. And so in places like the Capitol building, they actually have prisoners that are probably all, if not majority African-American doing like servant jobs, cleaning things up, uh, waiting on the politicians. It is just really weird to get a whole bunch of <laughs> Anglo white Anglo-Saxon politicians and African-American prisoners who are, essentially being used as slave labor and who knows how they became prisoners. Probably a lot of them for stuff like weed that doesn't even matter. But anyway, there's, there's also a link to be made of course, between l l income inequality and uh, low income areas near high income areas and how the people in the low income areas that are close by to people in high income areas have way more problems uh, sociologically. And that's just a true statistic across the board with no races required to make that argument. And that's probably something that's going on in Louisiana, I would imagine. But just check this out. Go read the 13th Amendment sometime, which is supposedly the Emancipation Amendment that ended slavery. Uh, there's a lot to that amendment, including making everybody citizens of the federal government instead of being citizens of their individual state governments. And a lot of shenanigans done legally based on that premise that no one's really even that aware of. But the craziest part about the 13th Amendment is it outlaws slavery, except it says you can have slaves if they're prisoners. It's totally cool if they're prisoners. So great job, uh, Louisiana, having basically plantation slavery for your capital. That's just incredible. Can't believe that's still a thing in 2020. Obviously, I'm being sarcastic. We should be really upset about that. But the big picture is that government itself is mind control. We talked about that in uh, the plus extension, man. I got so sidetracked with that. There's more to talk about for sure <laughs> about what was in the plus extension. Uh, let me get into that first, but I'll just say mind control and government, which mean the same thing definition wise are also both like, I think 137 is the number that they both share. So take that or leave it. But in the plus extension, we talked about mysticism and accepting the never ending unknown, the love and pursuit of the mystery itself being the goal. At least that's kind of my take on it. Maybe that's not what you'll get out of it when you hear it. But I write these notes. I do the best I can. 
Uh, we talked about darker cult and mind control symbolism in mainstream music and infiltrations into festival culture. Again, that wasn't a huge tangent. That's something I'm kind of more interested in. But one thing that did get really deep was Independence Day, which is July 4th, of course, 7-4. Jesus, which equals 74. Eclipse, eclipses, I guess, but eclipse equals 74. And the occult significance of the number 74 and occult itself also equals 74. So <laughs> there's this whole crucifixion code that Derek's been working out in relation to eclipses and celebrity deaths and all kinds of stuff. Go to his channel for more on it, but he does it great overview of it in this plus extension we also talk about the gematria of the human body the universe is god's game and the body is god's temple the number 26 derek's theory about why media events are coded by the numbers very deep and very plausible mercury and her slash hermes and the astrological connection between media conspiracy events and the space weather if you will the astrology of the time uh yeah the numerology that links government with mind control and we did talk about that. I love that. In the first hour, we got to talk about natural law some too. That was pretty awesome. Uh, we talked about the massive significance with the last and the next total solar eclipse over the United States and the gematria encoded in the United States and ancient world's distance measuring units, which that last one is a real mind blower because so one thing that Derek mentioned in the plus extension was that he doesn't see the flat earth idea as having validity other than i mean he wasn't like completely dismissive of it he wasn't calling flat earth believers stupid but he thought that it was more likely that the numbers that were given about the distances to different luminaries and bodies in the sky that that's all right because all the math shakes out but it makes me, i really wonder i mean first of all i'm earth shape agnostic so don't come at me from either camp and try to tell me i'm a shill <laughs> i don't believe nasa and i don't believe anything else till i can figure it out in a way that satisfies me for myself or have someone walk me through it in a way that I understand. But, you know, there are very interesting arguments for a flat earth. I kind of, I really like the, um, the orb theory, if you will, the cosmic egg theory. And that has history with a bazillion different mythological traditions, legendary traditions of cultures around the world. And I do think there's some seriously evil reasons that dark forces would want everyone to believe we're just a spinning rock of uh, a speck on a spinning rock flying through a limitless empty void instead of being in some kind of biologically designed experimental snow globe. Well, I don't know which is better <laughs> now that I think about it, but yeah, uh, he, he brought that up about the flat earth thing, but I have to say I could also see the same people that created the language that we use and gave us the, the heliocentric model, which is by the way, the Vatican again, the ding, 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 they could have easily fabricated astronomical distances to be numerically synchronistic and internally consistent, possibly as a way of encoding some other occult meaning behind all that, or as a way to try to show that it is a construct as far as the model goes. And it's not really the truth of things. I mean, I don't exactly know how to triangulate the distance from the earth to the sun using any tools that I've got to be fair. I haven't tried to figure that out, but you know, that's a really deep and crazy topic, and uh, maybe we'll get into it in more depth sometime in the future. But I really love talking to Derek, so I hope you guys are already subscribed to Gematronator on YouTube. He's a cool dude. We definitely have a lot in common, and I think we might even be friends now. <laughs> and I want to have him back. So he had uh, mentioned he's willing to come back, but he wants to do some kind of deep dive on a specific topic and not just sort of ramble around the multiverse like we just did on this one, overview style. So if there are any topics you'd like to see us do a Gematria breakdown on, some I could think of would be maybe like 9-11. That's probably so full of stuff. It might need more than one show, but maybe something not conspiratorial, maybe something cooler. I don't know. Let me know. And there's a couple of ways you can let me know if you have a Gematria episode you have in mind or just want to make a suggestion for any other guest or just want to hit me up. First of all, you can always email me, chance at interversepodcast.com. But I finally got the Interverse Discord channel set up. If you guys know about Discord, probably a lot of you do, but it's sort of a, it was originally for gamers, but it's just a nice handy chat app that you can get on your smartphone or on your computer or log into from a web browser. And we do have an Interverse Discord there. There's also an Interverse podcast group on Facebook. Doesn't seem super active. I'm not super active on Facebook, so that might 
be part of it. It's kind of the devil and I don't want to be there, but <laughs> I still get people finding my show through it. So I got to use it to an extent, or at least I feel like I got to use it to an extent. Technically I don't have to, but yeah, those are the three ways you can contact me and maybe even get in touch with each other. So get on the discord, come say hi. Let's all start some group chats on. We'll make some channels based on different topics. It'll be cool. And, um, you know, now just as I'm thinking about it, one of the channels on the discord could be like, Share your art. I really want that one. <laughs> Come on there and show me cool stuff you're making. That'll get me happy. I'm already pretty happy, but I'll be even happier. So I think this um, intro is, or outro, sorry, outro is getting close to 20 minutes. And I think that means it's probably time for me to wrap it up, right? I'm, I'm going to get to have too long of an episode here and mess myself up on file size. So I better go. But before I do, I'm going to play us out with a song by our friends elusive tuna they are listeners to the show out of bristol in the uk and they've got a cool new song called space face that they shared with me got some rick and morty references in it for the uh <laughs> keen ear to pick up and it's spelled their band is or, or their their production act if you will is called elusive tuna but it's spelled i-l-l-u-s-i-v-e-t-u-n-a you can find them on soundcloud linked in the show notes as well so it's the illest, usivist tunas out there. And uh, I like this kind of music. So was happy to play it on the show after they shared it with me. And if you make music, share that shit with me. Again, the Discord's a good way to do it, but you can message me on SoundCloud as well, I guess. And yeah, I got to go. This is definitely 20 minutes now. So too long, too long. Got a lot of stuff to say, apparently. Support the show on Patreon. Share the show with people that you know. In person is the best way to do it. The algorithms don't like the shares on Facebook and all that. But, you know, do what you can to get this kind of information out there and get people thinking outside of the materialist box. Even if you're skeptical of this stuff, you got to admit there's some appeal to it. Some interesting stuff to it. All right. I'm out of here. Love you guys. Talk to you later.
Radio. 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 Radio.